Hello, folks. Here we are for the Gamification Report, episode 14. When there's no getting over that rainbow, and the smallest of dreams won't come true, I can take all the madness this world has to give little Paul Williams for you there. This week we're looking at learning games and frustration, students building games and multi-user virtual environments. Let's see where we get into. The paper we're going to start to look at first of all deals with student frustration in games and this is really interesting. What they did in the study by Shamia Kurumbaya in 2018 is she did a st paper to look at whether when students had difficulty learning material in a gamified environment whether the, g the frustration was related to the game being bad or whether the content was difficult because um, you can build a great learning game and find that people are getting frustrated in learning it. And then you're saying, geez, I put all this work into the game and I'm not getting the outputs I'm looking at here. So she started to look at the physics background and game mechanics versus physics difficulty. So essentially, here they looked at the different predictors of the game mechanics versus the physics difficulty, and she compared them using these statistics, using the Cohen's D scale. And she found out, as we studied it, the problem was content specific. And that is that when people enter learning games, they're probably problem is related to the content not stronger than the game design, at least in this study, and I think this is somewhat generalizability. So we have a content area which creates frustration, and that content area in this case, in her study, was energy transfer, Newton's first law, and properties of torque. These were the areas that drove students nuts. So they had difficulty playing the game that involved physics because the concepts were difficult, independent of the game. So the domain knowledge uh, would, would be that which prevented frustration, that is if you knew the game uh, very, uh, very well you would be uh, not frustrated playing if you knew more about physics. And so the difficult concepts that she encountered were the barriers to learning. So therefore, the goal then would be to build games that reduce the frustration. Does that make sense? I hope it does. The idea that if you find an area that students are struggling with, that you build a game to try to address those areas to make them more conceptually understandable. What I do when I build uh, learning games with faculty members here at Humber, for example, is I have them list the five areas that they have diff they feel that they have difficulty teaching or that students don't do well at. And then what I do is I flip that over. I talk to students from the course, and I have them list five things that they didn't feel they get enough practice doing or that are difficult things to learn. And when you put that together, then you can build a game that tries to address the content specificity of the difficulty. So that other, if you didn't do this, you would come back and say, you know what, the game didn't work very well because people didn't learn. But what you're actually doing is building the game to tailor it to reduce the content specific learning challenge. I hope that makes a sense. So what they try to do is produce this, 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 this act of called engaging students in building games. And this was produced by another paper of Tassiana Pontual Falco in 2017. And this is exactly the kind of thing we're trying to do here at Humber and we're trying to do across institutions, that you produce a, a community of practice so that students are getting involved with you in helping to build the game, and that um, you tailor the build to the students' identified learning needs, just what I talked about, and that's exactly what she did in her studies, and this is increases engagement so that when students build uh, the games, you get higher academic achievement that occurs. So if you're going to design games for learning, it's important to take your end learners and involve them in the build process. You know, that sounds so simple, but we hardly ever do it in education at all. We never really talk to students at all. We just tell them what to do and slap them about with grades. This is flipping it so that the students become the architect of the game design. Now this fits very well with Leontiev's activity theory, 1972 and 1978. Do you not love my graphics today? I went through so much work to make it look good for you. And this is that we want to produce, just like a PowerPoint lecture or, or a description, a dynamic system which is interconnected to the environment. So when you're building, uh, activity theory talks about the idea that you want to look at the cultural historical perspectives and cognition. How does the person generally see the world, the, the game player? Um, then you want to develop what's called a participatory design after Vygotsky's school of 1962. Then using learning as a social practice and that we develop through activity and we create meanings so that we actually as we build the game, we build a game world or game experience which allows us to create meaning in the learning. And when we do that, that produces a narrative that's different for each student. So based on Engstrom's work in community and division of labor, this is one particular student in the study that developed it. So we can see that they used instruments, subjects, and objects, community, and rules. So all of these different aspects had to do with the way they built their game. So each student, as they're asked to contribute ideas for game development, is going to draw on various things like rules, division of labor, subjects, and objects, because they're going to be related to that particular student's experience. 
Now, what comes out of this is the ability to produce what are called team-based virtual learning environments. And we want to talk about this next in the, in the podcast here. And this is Abby Johnson's work where he tries to integrate multi-user virtual environments in modern classrooms, 2018. And what he uses is Larry Michelson's team-based learning instructional model. And that is that we have dungeons and raids that can occur in games. Let's look at a simple game like a, a role-playing game like World of Warcraft. So you have dungeons and raids. So each player has a role. So if we go into a dungeon, there's a five-man dungeon. You've got a healer, a tank, and three DPS. What a healer does is they keep the group alive as they're being attacked. The tank, it draws the attention of the mob. So the mob hits them and they're wearing armor so they can survive it. And then the DPS are damaged per second. These are people of other classes that try to kill the beast. So you've got a five-man team, and the teams are formed spontaneously in a game like World of Warcraft. Um, you go into the, the, the raid, the dungeon finder, and a few minutes later, a team is formed of people you've never met. One might be in Sweden, one might be in Japan, and you suddenly have to cooperate. So this idea that, that you have a dungeon or raid where we have a role, but teams form spontaneously. And then there is character progression that's built into these games, where the character level determines success. So if I'm a level 100, I'll be much more effective. So this produces team bonding using these massive uh, multiplayer online role-playing games. So how do we prepare for teamwork and transfer this to our real life? Number one, when you show up at a game, there's social pressure to complete. If you start one of these dungeons and you just decide to sit around and go have a damn sandwich while everyone else is trying to dungeon, they'll kick you from the dungeon. So there's social pressure that begins to act, and this is what we see in a lot of our learning games. If you come to the classroom and you've got a job to do in the game, you complete it. And, you know, we have got a lot of problem with absence in both university and college. A lot of students skip classes and get the notes from another student. And, and kind of, they call it kind of blodging their way through exams. Um, and, and so you have a high emotional investment when you use game paced learning in which you can show off your skills, you can pull off difficult tasks and repeat those tasks. So just showing up and having people depend on you is a powerful learning incentive. And then there's the preparation. You've invested in your avatar. If you're a high level healer in a game, then you've bought shields and weapons and armor that helps you heal people more effectively. And you can anticipate problems that you're going to come and you can engage or lead the group. This is exactly the kind of things we want to see in learning, but we don't see it happen very often because we're not using these game design principles. And there's this whole game that, the, that any good game that we build for learning should have a start, should have a mid game, and should have an end game. And we're moving toward the end game, which is an opportunity to prevail in the game, which is a composite of everything you've learned. But the mid game is our freedom to explore in which we have rich player choices and ways of deciding how we're going to approach the end game. And the start would simply be identifying challenges and the immediate gains that you, you occur in a game. So think about learning games. Uh, again, using deep gamification as a process of a journey in which there are these different stages to learning. Now, what we want to set and look at next in our, uh, in our review this week is the work of Tobias Gleich in 2017, and that is looking at functional changes in reward circuit in response to gaming-related cues with video games. So how can we, again, try to get an idea of how we engage people more deeply in games? And what they're doing here is they're talking about the idea that video games cause a decrease in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activity, and um, that these lead to, uh, that we also see with training with video games, leading to increased hippocampal activity, by training induced changes in tension and memory. And so the video game training, the changes that we see in the brain have to do with the experienced amount of fun, accomplishment, and frustration during training. And so when a game is fun, the player is performing well, experiences low frustration, we see more activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So we're starting to find there are specific parts of the brain that are switched on during game-based training and that we can track these for outcomes. And um, what uh, this leads us into is our next paper by Amon Rapp, 2017, in which they looked at the classification of rewards in World of Warcraft for the design of gamified systems. So if we look at the different parts of the brain that are activated during game-based learning, a lot of these are reward-linked. And what we want to talk about here is that we have complex and diversified reward systems. This is dip simple, differs from a simple badge. You do the following activities, we give you a badge, you do the next, like you're playing Duolingo. This is the idea of complex rewards. So we have design considerations that are based on values that players ascribe to rewards and different rewards for different players. Some rewards in the world of Warcraft are based on collecting, some on defeating a challenge, some on reputation by doing groups of tasks which are grouped by a quest line. Some are based on a high social demand, some are difficult, some are moderately difficult, some are easy. So do you see there's many different rewards and rewards in good video games. The same thing in gamification and game face learning. You have to have multiple reward systems built in. So a classification of WoW's rewards, we won't go into the 
this in detail, but talk us about the idea of enabling rewards, exchanging rewards, and flexible rewards. So we have values. An enabling resort, a reward gives you agency, progression, and power. Uh, you have experiential effects and motivation enhancement, possible game addiction. Some rewards can be so good. And they come, they, they have to do with the different gear that you could get. You can glyphs, abilities, add-ons that expose the performances to the group. We could talk about exchanging rewards in which you get gold in the game. And then you can talk about flexible rewards. Now, in the games that we've produced with Baycrest Health Sciences and with George Brown College and Ryerson University over the past few years, we've built all of these reward systems into the game now. So there's all kinds of things to do. And the, the hardest battle I have usually is talking to faculty members to get them to see that simplicity is no longer acceptable, that there's all kinds of different rewards and you build it. And we work with a vendor called Reach and uh, they're based in Edmonton, Alberta, and they produced a game engine that can track experience points, reputation, goal, all these things. And they, they, they put a lot of money into building this code, but there's more and more code available to gamify your courses, but you can do a lot of it with pencil and paper as well uh, by, by tracking it manually. But the idea that there are multiple reward systems. So let's talk about some of the things that players say. Reward experiences. For a hunter, collecting pets is the main rewarding activities of the game. I don't know why. They're simply beautiful. I like those dark colors as they reflect my personality. It's a sort of collecting. They make me feel as though we're living in another world with other entities. It's reassuring to collect. Uh, another reward experience had to do with world bosses in a place called Timeless Isle. I passed my last weeks trying to defeat the world bosses of Timeless Isle. This allowed me to gain a legendary cloak to face Ordos, another world boss that promises to drop incredibly precious loot. Even today, I spent about eight hours to empower my character toward the same. This meant also to repeat a series of raids in the hope of finding a rare drop that could better the skills of my mage. It's strange to say, but the only relevant goal that I had in my mind in the last two months was to reach this achievement. Uh, wouldn't we love that in learning? And this is exactly what we find. When we build learning games with multiple reward systems, students will play for hours and stay after class. They get obsessed with achieving that reward. Uh, another player comments that farming is always the same thing. I always make the same path to make my minerals. I memorized it a long time ago. It's boring, but it's useful for me and my group. So there's some rewards you might do each day, like a daily challenge, that are kind of routine, but they give you a sense of routine. To begin to see how this ties together, that the way human beings are built is we love that emotionality of rewards, and we have to build those into learning games and into learning in general. And I tell you, if you, unless you use these game design principles, it's not possible to build these into regular courses. You have to have multiple reward tiers and that's really, really hard to do unless you produce these game environments. This idea of agency, personal power, and achievement is very hooked up uh, into game uh, achievement. Each piece of gear, each new experience level, and each new unlocked dungeon open new possibilities for action. The progression was exponential. The more I advanced in the game, the more I felt free in choosing my own direction. <clears throat> the interesting thing was that I was connecting all these rewards with my character's abilities through them with my sense of agency in the game. So this highlights the idea that different kinds of players are sensible to different incentives. Some like to acquire rewards that strengthen confidence in themselves. We have confidence sliders in one game we did, we've done with Baycrest Health Sciences that we won in the Ted Friedman Award for recently, an international prestigious award. And that is that you can determine how much confidence you feel in your answers. And when you're just beginning the game, new nursing students die on the game. They just get slaughtered. But their confidence goes up, and their confidence was correlated in our statistics that we did with uh, solve rates. So as you get better at solving cases, your confidence slider increases, and we found positive connections. One of the reasons that makes WoW so effective and engaging is its capability of delivering rewards that might satisfy diversified desires. We might have many desires in each of us for different types of rewards, not just rewards connected for a certain type of player, but that each of us may have multiple level of rewards we're interested in. So what is WoW doing right? It's using a fundamental reward-based system that connects to social experience. You contain different prestige and item levels as you advance in the game. That's all we have for you this week. David Chandra, Center Teacher for Learning at Humboldt College. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.